I'm Pietro Bolsinelli. I work in, uh, in applied and persuasive games. And today I, I hope to talk about uh, how, to, uh, how to define and design and produce uh, this kind of uh, uh, applied games and persuasive applications. I'll start uh, with um, an application we developed together with Opera, the organizers of, of, uh, of this event which is in fact is a so-called persuasive application. If you search literature, persuasive applications are, are a, a field of study. And uh, these are applications that somehow influence uh, behavior. Uh, I start with examples because defining the very field of applied games, uh, or also called sometimes serious games, is, is uh, something very difficult by itself. So by I start with examples, so by hopefully describing the topic by seeing it in, in work. And there's a lot of discussion which terms, how to define them, and so on. Oh, so thank, thank you very much. <laughs> sorry, sorry for the delay. And thank you for coming, and thank you for all those who were at the workshop, which I also see uh, yesterday workshop, which I also see today. So, so going to the, to the first example. The example is autography. It's, an, uh, it's, a, it's a playful, persuasive application uh, which, uh, with which people can draw digital graffiti. It's, uh, and it's installed in the context of the Opera Duomo locations and works of art. If you go on the Campanile and on the Dome, you will see you can go out here, just close here, and try it and play with it. And uh, it's actually integrated with the Opera's website and uh, we created it together with, with Opera. It's been actually uh, creating, it's been a wonderful experience, and I'll, I'll go into some details about this. Uh, people are creating some wonderful drawings using the limited means that we put at their disposal. And um, in fact, some, some original, say, works, and also very traditional graffiti. And this is very interesting. They, with, they're using the digital application for doing graffiti. They're producing, they're using the same language and concepts with which they, do it, they did traditional graffiti. And in fact, as in all applied games, we did a lot of research before doing the application. And the research was done by the restorers of real world graffiti uh, from the opera. And, uh, and they sort of classify graffiti in families, and we find the same families in the digital ones. So while we de develop the applications, we also uh, offer the users the traditional tools for doing graffiti. So keys and, and sprays and, and, and also the kind of color, lipstick colors. So if you choose the lipstick, you have lipstick colors. And, and you know, these details are very important because people's perception of the quality of application is way more refined than, than you always suppose. This comes, in short, simple looking applications are never simple to, to build or make or develop. And so this application was meant for influencing behavior and creating participation. It was done in parallel while there was a restoration of the existing graffiti, some to be preserved because they're several centuries old, some to be cleaned and removed. And we actually started the brainstorming of this application with a different idea. It's often the case. And the idea was something to do something which would allow people to clean some digital graffiti and learn while cleaning how these operations go. But then we came with the idea that in fact in graffiti, as is well known in, in the world of contemporary art, there's something positive there, there's something, there's a need of expression, of leaving a sign. And so we, we instead change, switch, change ideas and let's say, well, let's make it easy instead of harder to create graffiti. And we suppose that we could use the, the application in, in several senses. So in, 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 in the location themselves, as an application, on the web. This was all the hypothesis. And of course, then, we, we enter the doubts phase, as in every in, in innovative project, okay? So, like, will they understand it's a positive message, or actually this will encourage people to do more real-world graffiti, or simply nobody will use it, it will be a waste of time and energy and so on. And we decided to, to, to take the plunge, and so we means together 
as an overlap together with Alice and <coughs> Pallanti, who, of course, you, they look a bit familiar for you, maybe because they look like pirates from the Caribbean or something, but you may have seen them around. And, and it worked. It worked uh, amazingly well, in fact. Uh, people uh, publish hundreds of those graffiti per day, and uh, we have a, a huge and growing archive of, of tens of thousands of, of graffitis. And, and what, was, what was most amazing is that people stopped doing graffiti on the walls. So this is an objective fact and result to be obtained with this application. And um, so then we, we, we extended it and we published also as a, an independent available application. Now, why? Let's ask ourselves, why? Why people do this? And uh, well, the, the application in place is something unexpected. Okay? It's something unexpected and surprise, sort of mystery, what it is about. In a place which is so formal, in a sense, so rich of history, okay? So you, you sort of behave in a certain way, you don't talk loudly, huh? this kind. And you see this thing which is completely unexpected, it's colorful and, 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 and bizarre. So surprise is, is something that motivates people. And somehow, <laughs> I don't know, maybe it's not the right place to say that, but people in museums and monuments are often very bored. Okay, so, so you, have to, you have to somehow give them something to do. And, and here you're giving not just something silly to do, but you're giving them something which, through which they can respectively express their emotion, their feelings, and the, how happy they are to be there. And in fact, this is what comes out from the application. So the fact that we can have fun in a formal context is, is interesting. <coughs> And finally, on the application, we then we went full circle. So we, we did a book. We published a paper book with the digital graffiti coming from the web and the application. And uh, it's, um, of course, it's a huge book. And, and the plan is to do a year with every year, do a, a copy of the book with the new, new graffiti. So, um, so this was one example. This is not a, exactly a game. This is, well, we'll get back to the term game, which is, which is uh, very ambiguous. Uh, but it's a sort of called persuasive application. So uh, what I do uh, in my work, I do uh, applied games and persuasive applications. I'll do more examples. So what's, what unifies all the examples of all the work I do is that I'm addressing real world problem with games. And there's nothing particular original in that. Huh? Uh, it's, it's something that's been long, going long, uh, existed for a long time, but with different degrees of success, let's say. And the techniques have been refined in time, and games have, by now, video games have, uh, uh, it's a media that has acquired its dignity, and it, this process of not being just about pure or silly entertainment is a process that almost all media go through, okay? If you like, so cinema, comic books, okay, so I heard this morning some interesting question about, uh, about games and how games, how can they deal with serious topics? But if you think about this, even like blockbuster Hollywood movies, they deal always with very serious topics and problems. And nobody is surprised by that, okay? Nobody's surprised by that. It's, there's been, when cinema started as sort of a copy of theater, and it didn't work as a medium, it had to evolve in time, you know, as, as you probably all know better than me. And, and so the same things has applied with games, has happened with games. And uh, uh, so, for example, this, this, this game I produced with the European Consortium of, of, um, of, of uh, universities that we wanted to uh, sort of unify laws about neglect and abuse kids neglect and abuse, so there can hardly be more serious topic than that, and we, we and, but the games uh, worked very well as a classroom tool to introduce to the problems in a way that is, this is gradual, interactive, and so on. And I won't go, in, go into much details, I will be publishing the slides after the conference, but there are several other examples. This is Feel Better, this is for kids in hospital, uh, hospital long-term uh, therapy, 
We did the unification of the global goals for UNESCO. This is about architecture uh, rezoning. This is about IT problems and technology, and so on. And this is about literature, about uh, the wonderful work about the camera on classical literature, which again is seen as something very boring, but it's not boring at all if you, if you propose it in the right way. And, and even in most unlikely things, like the safety of offshore platforms, can become you know, like these deeply, uh, deeply boring themes uh, can become extremely interesting if presented, uh, presented appropriately in, in the right way in context. And in fact, I too didn't believe much in the possibility that the applied games uh, work, but they, they mostly, at least in my experience, they mostly do sometimes in unexpected ways and unexpected applications. And, uh, and um, of course, you have to be very careful in, in how you produce them and, and um, how is the whole process done. And so I will try to get into a bit uh, into, into this process. So, so let's try to learn more about applied games. So video games in general are about complexity. And, and uh, most of the time, the underlying mechanics and mechanic or mathematical model is a model of extreme complexity. So tendentially non-computable problems. So games are interesting when What's behind it, just below it, is something which is not uh, easily linearly computable, okay? And, uh, and in fact, even very simply looking problems like Mastermind, if anybody has played that, uh, are actually very, very hard to solve. Uh, I'm looking here, just as, this is just one of the many dimensions we have to consider when building games, but this is just to give you a feeling for that, some <coughs> terminology to be used. And also I've been using the term, when you use the term video game, people actually mean all sorts of different things, okay? Like, like uh, sometimes what they mean, in particularly when you're dealing with, with researchers or cultural institutions, sometimes they mean toys, so not video games. Something digital with which you can interact in different ways, but it, it doesn't have rules, doesn't have a purpose, doesn't have win-lose conditions. So that's a toy, even if it's in digital form. So classical example, Minecraft. Minecraft is not a video game, okay? It's a toy, okay? You interact with it. But if you, if you then you can add dimensions to this approaching what, what a video game is. So, um, so like if you have problems, and only one problem to solve, that's a puzzle. You're not yet there, okay? If you add competition, you have a contest. If you have decisions, Okay, a uh, very famous game that I said, games are a set of interesting, or the keyword is interesting decisions, then you, you, you probably have a certain category of games, eh? and so on. There are also different ways of classifying these very complex terms, like you can have, in general, interactive systems, you can have coaching applications, so applications that are interactive and guiding you, but have nothing of exactly of a video game. You can have interactive tutorials. You can have persuasive applications like the one we've seen. So my, my aim here is just to give you a feeling for the complexity and there is a terminology that can help you define what you want to do and what you want to obtain, okay? And then the second crucial point is how games are connected to learning. Now, if you read Ralph Koster, which is an author which, if you want to understand more about games, you should absolutely read, uh, he actually identifies playing with learning. It's not that play causes learning, play is learning, okay? So, and if you start thinking about this, this is an idea that can grow, can grow, okay? If you, if you think about counter uh, example and example, but I also, encourage you to be cautious about, be a bit suspicious about this metaphor. Because it, it may be that every time that we play, we are learning, but the point is, what are we learning? Mm? Something that may give you the sensation that you're really getting the point is the fact that often when you completed a game, 
Okay, I can finish this game. I don't want to play it anymore. It was both cool. Okay, you can think of it, rephrase it. I learned everything there was to learn in this game. Okay, there's the same kind of experience. Okay, that's the same kind of feeling. So it would be a torture if you were forced to play again. Okay, or learn something that you're already familiar with, going beyond that. Now, uh, and I just want to take a little side note and tell you a little story about a game. Uh, they had to design about uh, about um, um, long-term illnesses. Uh, it was about diabetes, and I had a big discussion when I, I entered into this project when the project was already running, and they had defined a game in the most hardcore uh, possible uh, metaphor using the terms of it was like a sort of third-person shooter, <laughs> and so it was based on category competition reward and levels. So this was extremely non-inclusive, was towards a certain anagraphic, and, and the, the theme and the game were, were casually, completely casually, but actually disconnected. So it was really hard work to turn their work, and we're still remaining inside the domain of games, so this is to give you an idea of how vast and ambiguous this universe can be, by changing the language and changing the model with inclusiveness, m having a mentor, have a story, and the game facilitating a transformation process of the habits in order to prevent the evolution of, of uh, this affliction. So, um, and, and so this is one point. The other point, uh, um, when discussing about games that brings confusion, is the term gamification and all the discussion about this. And Jan Bogus is another author which I strongly advise you to read, who is probably considered one of the most important game critics, <coughs> put simplified things for everyone by saying that gamification is bullshit. And it's, a, it's a, actually an academic paper called exactly like this, and which I encourage you all to read. It's beautifully written. And in, and I won't go into any detail about that because we don't have the time, but uh, in short, it, does this have anything to do with what I'm talking about? No, it doesn't, okay? Because gamification is a different kind of process, okay? So it's a, it's a different kind of process, and this is a slide by Bogos, which I, which I simplified, which I sort of simplified in this table, and it's a, it's a different kind of process it's a different kind of language. So gamification is about adding some decoration to something existing in order to make a, a quick feedback look more rewarding. That's not what you're doing when you're building applied games. When you're building applied games, you're building something from scratch, which is meaningful as it is meaningful, the theme that you're dealing with. Okay? But I encourage you to be very cautious when you're thinking of getting involved in using games for education, of, non, of not exchanging these two directions, which are different kind of jobs, different kind of people that you're working with. Okay. Um, so, what is the principle which I'm <laughs> defending here? Well, the process should be that you develop from scratch a custom-built game or interactive application that will progressively, and he, here the term is progression, familiarize the player about the non-trivial topic. Uh, and this progression is key uh, in, in, in games for learning, and I think it's key also in applied games. And I simplify this with, with uh, these two graphs which are actually from uh, the draft of a book I'm writing on this team. And the, the one on the left uh, is a classical um, scheme about how, how you design games, which in which at the growth of the skill of the player, you have to grow the difficulty of the, of the game itself. Otherwise, it will be boring. So if the, if the graph goes towards the exponential, it's, it's growing too much, uh, no, it's growing too, too, too little, and so it becomes boring. If instead it's too flat, like a logarithm, then it's becoming uh, too difficult and so frustrating and will stop playing. So you have to keep this, doing this balance in between. And if you think about it, I think this is very useful metaphor for learning 
when, you, when you're learning something, and maybe also for a museum experience, okay? So this progression, okay? I think in the first talk we had, it's a really wonderful talk about the director, director about the museum. I think in, even there, there is some sense in the way they built the exposition in the Opera Duomo Museum of this progression, okay? So there's, there's somehow the theme represented with different levels of details. And of course, of course, if you build an architecture, you have less uh, let's say flexibility in changing things in reactiveness. But in a game, these games are made for changing while you're using them. So they're perfect for, I think, in this sense, they're very, very good tools for learning. And another misunderstanding, I think, that from, from, from people that don't work in games and want to use games uh, is identifying using games as labs, okay? As simulation environment. I've met this again and again. So it may be, but most of the time they aren't. So you're not building a game in the sense that we are building an interactive model of the formal model of the knowledge that we're proposing, okay? No, we are taking the formal model of, of the knowledge that you have, okay, and from that we build something different, which is, it has its own specific language, the language of games, and it's not just, not just, it's not a lab, okay? So it's, in games you, you, you don't, say, prepare experiments and then test it, okay? you're going through a process. And I know it's a it's, it's subtle difference, but it's a big difference in about what you, what you get in the end. Games are not by themselves simulations. Of course, in the underlying model, in all the laws and all the mechanics that the game is moving, there is a modeling of the theme, but it's a more indirect uh, uh, approach. Another interesting thing uh, that is specific to games that one can use uh, is what happens when you fail. In learning, I think, uh, and personally, I think that schools deal very, very, in the, most, the, in the worst possible way with failure, okay? And, and games hint to a different approach, okay? So failure is not a disaster, okay? So the fact that uh, failure is a disaster, people that are used to playing games don't view failure as a disaster. Okay, the view failure is, okay, let's try again. Okay, let's try again with different conditions. So it's very important, and I think not only what you do when, you, when, when the player is failing, so how much you go backwards, how much you, but also what you do, you could develop a bit sensitivity about this, about that when you're designing games. What happens between one attempt and the other? That's very important in games. It's a space where the player is extremely receptive to learning. So if you, if you use in-between spaces to teach something, and so the design, so if, if in a game you're using something like, I don't know, Pac-Man or something like that, or Bejeweled or something like that, what happens between one attempt and the other, that also should be a subject of refined design. It's not something that should be left just, oh, let's put the score there and then you try again. If you're doing a learning game, that's a great opportunity for teaching something. Okay, so which is schematized here. Now, how are applied games produced? Well, as we are dealing with complexity and we have the luxury of a process that is not like uh, building walls, okay, we have a lot of opportunity of cycling so that uh, creating prototypes or, or partial solution, testing and getting feedback. So this is, this, this kind of way of proceeding, this loop way of proceeding is, is um, uh, something which is necessary. And it's probably necessary to do it even when you re actually release the thing to the public. All the games that you've seen before, example I made before, they have been changed after they have been published. It's very important to get some kind of feedback, not explicit feedback, I'm saying behavioral feedback, which, is, which are two different things, two very different things. By me, what I did mean by this is the fact that what people will tell you about your game is almost 
irrelevant and often useless. But what people do when using your game, that is very interesting, okay? Because they are incompetent in using the right categories for classifying what you're doing, but they're very competent in playing the game. So that's, that's where you can really learn, okay? And yeah, another thing which I've, in my experience has seen often people from the outside take for granted is that if it's a game, then it will be interesting. It's actually the other way around. Because our standards for what a video game is are incredibly high, okay? So you have a big problem doing an applied game. Because people will expect your applied game, which is built with your 50,000 euro budget, to be to have the same quality, same gameplay experience quality of a 50 million euro budget game, okay? And this, so this way there are several things you can use to work around this. First of all, you have to, so the worst possible things that you can do is to copy an existing game. So that's a, that's a classical shortcut suggested. Oh, let's copy an existing game. So we reduce the cost of, of development. But in that case, you're violating everything I said up to now because you're not building something that's meaningful. And also, copying a good game is extremely hard, okay? So, so you're really narrowing yourself in, in the worst possible, possible solution. Um, so instead, instead, using the specific topic and the specific uh, theme, uh, which is, has some, a lot of depth, and this is something that if you're coming from a museum, from art, comes, you have it. It's something that you have for free, which instead, it's a problem. Well, I got... I got uh, robbed both by the previous, so I, I need some more minutes. <laughs> um, and uh, I can be lost now. <laughs> well, so, so there, there are several ways to reduce your cost, but I would, it's very important that you use the original content that you have available. That's a really precious asset that you have. And that somebody that is building games just for building games does not have. So you, as, a, as a, an applied game builder, can use this as something that can help you a lot. Um, yeah, so I was saying, um, so the fact it's a game does not make it interesting by itself, okay? And I think this fact that asking yourself, why would anybody care about uh, 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 about playing this game, I think that people in museums, this is a problem they have to deal all the time, no? Uh, why would anybody be interested into this exposition? Uh, uh, well, how can I make the experience more, more interesting, okay? Well, I think in my experience, you have to find the right form, okay? Because all this is based on the assumption, which is, I hope, most of the time true, that people are actually interested in knowledge. The problem is the wall that they find in front of them, okay? Um, I talked about this. Um, then there is that dimension of inclusiveness, but I won't deal too much of, about this because people that, I mean, people come from video games are not so used to dealing with this, but people that work with museums have probably a lot of more experience about this. And also, so this has to move to the digital realm uh, a lot. And in fact, there is a lot of um, uh, knowledge and experience if you search for it, about inclusiveness, about uh, like games for, for um, visually impaired people. There are some beautiful audio video games and there's a, there's a lot of things you can do there. It's, it's, a, it's a domain which has knowledge and experience if you search for it. Okay, um, sorry. Now, how do you, how do you um, map, move from, from your specific domain to, to building an applied game? Well, I, I no longer have time to go into detail about this, but I will just say that um, you need somehow to transform your knowledge in somehow an atomic form, in atomic forms. So like little piece of your knowledge and structure them in a growing tree. Like, like so 
what I can teach at the beginning, what I can teach after a while, and so on and so on. So if you, if you, if you work with a game designer, then this will be progressively transformed in formulas, spreadsheets, and so on, mechanics. So link the mechanics, the articulation of your knowledge into something that can become a flow, interactive flow, and, uh, um, and that's the way you proceed. Okay, um, I, I think I said uh, most of the things. Ah, yes, well, one, one, just one thing. One thing you have to take care in, in the initial defining is, and this is a nice way to test whether your idea makes sense, is, again, this is something assumed when you're starting to play a game, is what is the interaction second to second, okay? Interactive, I mean this interactive environment. What happens, how does the game react? What's the feeling? This is another technical term which sounds familiar with, but it isn't. It's a specialized technical terms based on constants, reaction times, and, and a lot of uh, human machine interaction. But that's extremely important. And because uh, you expect, of course, you expect the game to be reactive, reactive moving. And so if you examine second to second, minute to minute, session to session, day to day, what is going to happen? This is a great way to clarify your ideas. So uh, going on, I, I think I already told you most of the things you, that you should avoid when you're working with a game designer. So cloning, um, also assuming that a prototype of your game is much easier than to do the game itself. That's like assuming I'm going to build the prototype of a car. I don't need a car. I just need a prototype of a car. Okay, which means something that runs, I can drive and go on. A prototype of a car is like a prototype of an airplane or a prototype of a space shuttle. A prototype of a space shuttle is the space shuttle. Okay, so the same with the game. Once it runs, when it goes, when the feedback is going, you did most of the work. So be, be, beware, okay? Um, the idea of mini game, there's no such thing as a mini game. The expectation of a mini game are the same for a full game, okay? So, so be beware also of that. Um, also, be careful in asking costs for game development before starting. It's a, it's it would be a random number because you don't know it before because you don't even know what you're going to build because you will need to change ideas while you're building it. And there's a there's a if you search for no, no estimates, there are lots of techniques to improve this kind of process and a lot of research. Okay, um, yeah, and so also the methodology with which you're developing games should be adapted to the fact to you should be conscious, should be aware that you're dealing with complexity and so it will need to change while you're, 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 you're building. Last thing, I will, these are some books which I suggest you if you want to get, uh, learn more. Surely a theory of fun, Coster, The Art of Game Design, Chessy Shell, and Game Theory. And from the theoretical point of view, I think the, the most important researchers in the field that can tell you about the relationship between persuasive games, applied games, and all the required classifications and really subtle distinctions. Of course, Sebastian is German, is a friend of mine. And uh, Sebastian Derterding, I think, is the author to, to follow. And this, this, uh, this is a one wonderful book. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have. Yes, sir, sir. No, wait, wait, quick question. Can you put the previous slide? Yes. Okay. <laughs> 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 It's a persuasive application. So, so, it's, so it's not any of those. It's not any of those, exactly. So I started with something which is not actually in any of the classifications. <laughs> but why isn't it a toy? Well, in the sense that you're not free to create, uh, I mean, the combinatorial space underneath it is extremely limited. Mm -hmm. So you can create only one kind of object with a graffiti. Of course, it depends on the level which you look at, but then you may say, oh, well, 
in fact, people have done the most original stuff with it, okay? Not everything has been published, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, so in this sense, no, it, it's, it's not a toy, it's a specific application. No, because I think it's very interesting, I mean, it, what you said in light of also what James Bradford said before, I mean, the risk of having a game inside a museum is that a game, as you rightly said, is very, very absorbing. And there's the risk of subtracting <coughs> from what you're supposed to be seeing around you. Now, photography is actually quite wonderful because it's, it's light. Yeah. But it's actually deeply connected to the material objects that you're looking at. Yeah. Yeah, um, this, this, uh, that's because it's built for that. See, it's built from yeah. scratch for that and respecting the knowledge. So it's, not, it's built by talking with the people who actually do the restoration of the graffitis. Mm -hmm. And you somehow, you feel it, not for a topic, but in general. You feel when a game is built with a background research that has a sense. We have, again, we're not refining when you talk about it. But you feel it in, in, in uh, it's like with a book. If the author has researched a theme, you know it, you yes. feel it. Even if he doesn't talk about it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, it's very strange, but that's. I have just a further small question about, about that. How, how did you decide which surfaces, I haven't said this before, uh, which surfaces to use to allow people to write on? Oh, well, the surfaces, again, are not, are not uh, arbitrary invention. They are the, the real surfaces with of the materials with which the dome and, and the but not every corner is available or, or yes I mean no no the surfaces they're, they're the material of the surfaces so wood and the kind of right kind of wood mm -hmm. uh, marble and uh, copper so everything where people went and did oh, their yes. graffiti it's inside the application but but you're talking about the paintings well no I mean yeah. I see that you picked some and I thought, I was wondering if it was actually related to where people had written actually handwritten graffiti before. No, no. No, not no. that part. That part. That part has to be refined a bit. The materials are the ones, the part mm -hmm. on the materials. The, the, and in fact, the, the two applications are slightly different because on the Campanile, mm -hmm. uh, you have only the materials because there are no paintings. Right, and, okay, and the other one, no, I mean, that makes sense. it's the same yeah. application, but no, the paintings part is it's just a sketch for the moment, only three paintings. Mm -hmm. But there are, of course, as yeah. you know, the surface <laughs> is enormous, so there's room for expansion. <laughs> um, maybe one more question. We have a coffee break coming up, but um, really? Are you out of water? <laughs> um, all right, let's, um, let's all have coffee now. Um, and. Uh, Yes, we will be available to answer yep. questions during that. And then we also have a round table at the end where we have another opportunity for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.